Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to the uh, Issues in National Security Lecture Series. Uh, again, I'm Professor John Jackson. I'll be the MC for uh, the fourth in our series. We're going to do 10 of these, and so we're at number four at this point. Uh, before we uh, turn it over to our speaker, I'd just like to mention a number of visitors who are here with us. Uh, and they will make themselves available after the lecture. If you have any questions about life in, at Naval Station Newport, they will help you uh, answer some of your questions, perhaps. We have Ann Champney and Laura in the back with the Fleet and Family Support Center. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Uh, Dean Weideman and his club manager, Lindsay, are down here, and they can talk to you about uh, food service options available here on base. If you'd like to throw a wedding or anything else, they can, uh, they can help you with any and all of that. And for the first time, we have a Eugenie Genero from Humana Military. And that's the uh, contractor that is the interface for all TRICARE issues that the uh, U.S. Uh, families may have. And she's here with some handouts and some other information. So after the lecture, if you get a chance, go up there and chat with her. So, so now to our distinguished guest speaker. Dr. Craig Simons currently serves as the Ernest J. King Distinguished Professor of Maritime History at the U.S. Naval War College, and he is a Professor of History Emeritus from the United States Naval Academy, where he taught for 30 years and served as department chair. He's the author or editor of more than 20 books, including Lincoln and his Admirals, Abraham Lincoln, the U.S. Navy, and the Civil War which won the Lincoln Prize, the Barondess Prize, the Laney Prize, the Lehman Prize, and the Abraham Lincoln Institute Book Award. The only prize he's not won is best in show at the Westminster Dog Show. <laughs> but I understand he came close. I understand he came close. His current faculty appointment is actually a return engagement since he served on the Naval War College faculty while Admiral Stansfield Turner was president back in the early 1970s. American historians, as well as the general public, have consistently ranked Abraham Lincoln as America's best president. Tonight's lecture will use the prism of Lincoln's relation with and management of the U.S. Navy during the Civil War to assess the particular characteristics of his leadership style that made him so effective. At this point, Dr. Simons, the podium is yours, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you, John, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming here on this rainy afternoon. Um, it occurred to me, though, that this is the last chance to party hardy. You know, this is Mardi Gras, and if this is your idea of how to celebrate those last moments, <laughs> we're all in trouble. Um, I'm going to talk about this fellow, uh, Abraham Lincoln. This is my favorite photograph of him. This was taken the same month that he delivered his most famous speech at Gettysburg on November 19th, 1863, to dedicate the cemetery there. It's often used as the cover of books or other uh, public venues. Um, I think it shows a 54-year-old man and what the presidency can do to you uh, in very difficult times. And yet, as John mentioned, uh, Abraham Lincoln is almost always rated usually in the top two. He sometimes uh, has a little face-to-face uh, -face with George Washington for the best president in the history of the United States, but it's usually Abe Lincoln on the top. I'm on the 100-man committee of historians that makes those decisions every year. And every year we talk about what are the characteristics that made him the best president. Now, one surely is the degree of difficulty that he confronted. I mean, he's obviously the president who presided over a civil war, which has no other president yet has had to do. So that was difficult for him. And he did so with very little preparation beforehand, at least no formal preparation. He entered the White House with relatively little political experience, a one term as a congressman from Illinois in the 1840s, and no other governmental experience other than that of a prairie lawyer. Uh, and yet he presided over, as I mentioned, the most difficult circumstances in the nation's history. Um, he was commander-in-chief, but exactly what that meant was unclear. I think the founding fathers who wrote the Constitution 
uh, did that in part because they knew who the commander in chief was going to be once the Constitution was ratified. It was going to be George Washington. And you didn't have to tell him what his duties were as commander in chief. What it says in Article 2, Section 1 is that the president is the commander in chief of the Army and the Navy, full stop. It does not say what that entails, what obligations are incurred thereby. George Washington took it quite literally. In his first term, there was an uprising of individuals in western New York who didn't want to pay an excise tax on whiskey, the famous Whiskey Rebellion. George Washington put on his old uniform, got on a horse, and led the militia out to western New York until they said, okay, okay, we'll pay the tax. In other wars, however, uh, James Madison, for example, stayed in the White House. He rode out in a carriage to watch the Battle of Bladensburg, but that didn't go our way, so he went quickly back to Washington, D.C., where he famously packed up the portrait of George Washington and left town. Um, what exactly are the duties of a commander-in-chief, particularly in a time of civil war? Lincoln had so little to go on. So what were the elements of his leadership style? And to try to plumb that question, I'm going to look at three call them case studies if you like, from a very broad lens, I'm going to look at sort of an international event early in the war that Lincoln had to deal with that required him to figure out exactly what those duties might be. And then I'm going to narrow it down to kind of an operational uh, case study, if you would, a theater-wide case study. And then we'll get really down into the weeds and look at a, a darn near tactical circumstance he had to deal with. So those will be my three goals. Kind of imagine a funnel as we narrow down that aperture, looking at problems that Abraham Lincoln confronted and how he confronted them. And then maybe we can winkle out some of the characteristics of his leadership style uh, to figure out why he was successful in doing so. We'll start with this guy. Not exactly a household name. Uh, Charles Wilkes was a naval officer, as you can see him here in a naval uniform. Um, his great claim to fame prior to the Civil War was the fact that he had led what was known as the Great United States Exploring Expedition from 1838 to 1842. This was a period of peacetime when the Navy was sort of looking for things to do, and one of the things was explore parts of the world that were as yet unexplored. This is the era, after all, when Charles Darwin, on board the Beagle, made great scientific discoveries. With those kinds of things in mind, the Navy decided it would create an expedition of five ships to sail literally around the world, taking samples of flora and fauna, making notes of scientific things. And they would carry with them a gaggle of scientists and uh, botanists and biologists and all sorts of people. And as they offered this plum assignment to a number of the Navy senior captains, you could almost see them working it out. Now, wait a minute, I'm going to be gone for, what, almost five years? Um, I'm going to have a bunch of scientists on board, and we're just going to go collecting rocks and stuff. I think maybe I'll pass. And that happened often enough that the assignment actually got all the way down to then Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, um, who happily took the job. It perhaps was not the best possible assignment. Wilkes turned out to be not a particularly good onboard commander. Uh, those of you who walked along Thames Street downtown and noticed in that wonderfully named shop, Hey Sailor, the t-shirts that are for sale saying, the beatings will continue until morale improves, his motto. <laughs> he was not a popular commander, uh, so much so that about uh, a year or two into the voyage, many of the enlisted men said, well, our, our terms have expired, so we're going to leave the ship. He said, no, that not, that's not going to happen. And he uh, just simply said, I'm sorry, you, you may not. Um, I'll tell you what I will do. If you really want to leave the ship, I'll leave you on this abandoned, uncharted, unnamed desert island and wave you goodbye as we sail over the horizon. Well, no, okay, maybe we will re-enlist after all. Interestingly enough, when the Marine contingent on board took him up on that and said, yeah, fine, we can do that, uh, he instituted a new protocol, which is quite literally to beat them until they re-enlisted. It's a good recruiting ploy if you can get away with it. My point in telling you all that was to point out that Charles Wilkes was a somewhat, shall we say, problematic 
commander. And so after the great exploring expedition, which turned out to be, by the way, a great success, the collection that he brought back, the flora and fauna and stuffed animals and rocks, all became part of a collection that was housed on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and put into a building paid for by a man named Smithson. It's the beginning of the Smithsonian Institution. In addition to which, he also discovered, when sailing along the ice pack uh, at the bottom of the Earth, if I can describe it that way, that underneath all that ice was an actual, no kidding, continent. So he's the discoverer of Antarctica. And if you look at your atlases after you get home, you will notice about a third of it is still labeled Wilkes Land. So he did literally put his stamp on the map. But he never got another sea command. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, he was the manager of the Lighthouse Board. But in Civil War, the Navy needs all of its officers, even the indifferent ones, and so he was recalled to active duty and given the command of a ship, the USS San Jacinto, named for the battle in Texas that helped win Texas independence. And in command of the San Jacinto, he received a set of orders telling him to go to Hampton Roads and join up with a squadron that was forming for an attack on Port Royal, South Carolina, that would be commanded by Samuel Francis DuPont. But Wilkes is one of those officers who considered orders to be suggestions. And so he thought he had a better idea. He had read in the newspapers, accurately, that two Southerners named James Murray Mason and John Slidell had been appointed by the Confederate government to be ambassadors of the Confederacy to the court of St. James, to Britain, and to Napoleon III's court in Paris. And their job, of course, was to convince Britain and France to join in the war as an ally of the Confederacy, break the blockade, win Southern independence, break up that American Union that threatens British trade and so on. And Wilkes decided it was his duty to make sure they never got there. He knew that they had run through the blockade and made it to Havana in Cuba. And from there, they actually bought tickets on a British packet steamer, the HMS Trent. Now, the HMS is important there because this is not simply a passenger steamer. It's not the SS Trent. This is a ship of Her Majesty's government. It's a mail carrier. And in that capacity, it has official status. But none of that bothered our friend Wilkes. In the San Jacinto, uh, he actually uh, stopped the Trent just, just outside Cuban waters, Spanish waters. Sent a boarding party on board, which you can see down here. Um, told the captain to line up everybody on board because he was going to take two of his passengers off this ship, to which, of course, the British captain said, like hell you are, I will not cooperate, get off of my ship, you are violating international law. Upon hearing that, John Slidell, the Louisianan who'd been tapped for the court of Napoleon III, raised his hand and said, I'm one of the guys you're looking for recognizing that it, he could probably do much more good in breaking diplomatic relations between the United States and France by allowing himself to be captured than he could by convincing the French government to get into the war. So sure enough, uh, the uh, Marine boarding party from the San Jacinto laid hands on them, a literal term, put their hands on their shoulder, walked them over to the side, down into a boat, took them and their two male secretaries on board the San Jacinto and brought them back to the United States. It was a boffo hit with the public. This is in November of 1861. The, the Battle of Bull Run, the Battle of Ball's Bluff, neither of which had gone the way of the Union, had depressed public morale to the point that the public really needed some good news, and to them, this looked like good news. This looked like the cop on the beat. Our friend Wilkes here is arresting these two fellows. They look like ne'er-do-wells, don't they? Uh, and was hauling them off. Notice they represent chivalry down here. Um, hauling them off to jail where they belong. 
But the captain of the Trent was right. It was a violation of international law. And this created an enormous problem for Lincoln. He could do one of two things. He could take advantage of this groundswell of public heroism that the American people had endowed on Wilkes and congratulate him, give him a medal, invite him to the White House, and risk the wrath of both Britain and France or he could chastise him, punish him in some way, thereby perhaps, perhaps avoiding war with the European powers, but at the risk of fragmenting his administration. Remember, he had been elected with 39.6% of the vote. 11 states had left the Union. He's in the middle of a civil war. And even his own party is fragmented into pieces that can't agree on such critical issues as the future of slavery. If he cannot hold together his political coalition, he cannot fight the Civil War. He has to do one or the other. So what does he do? And here's the first insight, I think, into Lincoln's management style. I'll tell you what he does. Nothing. And sometimes that's the right answer. In 1858, a sub uh, aqueous cable had been laid between Washington, D.C. and London, but it broke in 1859 so that communications between Europe and the United States took place the old-fashioned way. You wrote it down on a piece of paper, you put it in an envelope, you gave it to a ship which crossed the Atlantic. Then that government thought about it, decided what to do, wrote a response, put it in an envelope, put it on a sh another ship to recross the Atlantic. Lincoln knew he had at least five weeks before anything hit the fan. And in five weeks, lots of things could happen. For one thing, the public enthusiasm for Wilkes might disseminate. We are, I think, as a people, I'm not surprising anybody, not letting any cats out of the bag here, kind of impatient and short-sighted. We want it, we want it right now, but we forget about it tomorrow. So that might go away. Secondly, it allowed Britain and France to think about it, to see just how harsh their response would be. What kind of reaction would there be from Britain? So let's wait. He didn't promote Wilkes. He didn't chastise Wilkes. He waited. So did everybody else. Here's Britain in a, you saw a previous cartoon from an American paper, here's one from Punch. Britain waiting for an answer. Um, when the answer from London came, it was pretty startling. Uh, it said, uh, you must immediately release both Mason and Slidell from custody. They were being held on Governor's Island in New York Harbor. You must release them immediately. You must apologize to Her Majesty's government and you must swear you will never do it again, or we will withdraw our ambassador and begin preparations for a declaration of war. Okay, now I see what the consequence will be. What to do. In truth, Lincoln got a bit of help uh, on this from uh, this man. This is uh, William Henry Seward, his Secretary of State, previously his rival for the Republican nomination, now his closest advisor. I have no idea why Seward decided to be photographed in profile. <laughs> His staff referred to him as the great macaw. Um, but Seward was a sharp cookie, especially politically. And it was Seward and Lincoln together talking it over who came up with the idea of how to respond to this ultimatum from London. And here's what they said. Well, thank you. We now realize that finally you appreciate how wrong you have been. We have been saying since 1812 that ships of a foreign government cannot stop other ships on the high seas and take people off them without permission. That's called impressment. We went to war with you in 1812, and now finally you admit that we were right and you were wrong, so okay, we'll release Mason and Slidell. And it worked. It worked because releasing Mason and Slidell did not cause a reaction at home politically that fragmented his party. It worked because enough time had passed that the release of Mason and Slidell, which was actually the sine qua non of the demand, 
kind of met what was expected, and so he survived. That's case study number one. Here's number two. This is John Rogers, another naval officer, a little bit different from uh, our friend Charles Wilkes. Uh, John Rogers, uh, famously of a Navy family, his father was the John Rogers of the War of 1812, who won some frigate duels in that war, was a senior officer, in fact, during the War of 1812. This is his son. He also had a brother, Christopher Raymond Perry Rogers, so it was a Navy family from way back. And uh, this John Rogers had been in the Navy for 42 years and was a lieutenant. Not, not because he's a bad officer, it's because that's how fast promotions came in the 19th century. So you can imagine when the Civil War broke out, he thought, oh my gosh, here's my opportunity at last. And he got a set of orders. Here they come from Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, his hands probably trembling as he tore open the letter and read, oh, I'm going to get at least command of a ship, maybe a squadron, a fleet. Come on, let's dream. And he read his orders that you were hereby directed to report to Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> there are no ships in Cincinnati, Ohio. But there would be, because in the American Civil War, the rivers, particularly the Mississippi, the Ohio, and the, uh, and the Cumberland and the Tennessee, were the key elements of transportation in the West. Railroads were important, but you could burn railroad bridges, you could cut telegraph lines, you can't stop a river. And river communication and river transportation were absolutely key to winning the war in the West. And winning the war in the West was key to winning the war. So it actually was an important assignment, not that John Rogers was very excited about it, but he, he went, he got there, he bought some steamships, and began putting them together. Here you see how centrally located Cincinnati is to this whole situation. This whole transportation network here was what he was working with. And to do that, he built some gunboats, wood clads, they were called. Everybody's heard of the ironclads. It became famous in 1862. Well, had a few of those too, but most of them were wood clads. Here you can see uh, the USS Lexington, uh, which had been just a conventional river steamer, but he rerouted the steam lines to put them below the water line, clad it with six inches of timber, armed it with some six, uh, six inch rifles, and uh, commissioned it as a warship. And they say in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And these ships are absolutely dominant on the river. But the whole campaign also involved developing technology. And one of the interesting pieces of technology that developed in this was something called a mortar boat. And I always have to be careful when I say that, because it's not a motor boat. There's no motor on this. It's a mortar boat. Those big, gigantic, uh, witches brewing pots of mortars fired shells just a little bit bigger than a basketball filled with powder on a high arcing trajectory that could go around the bends and rivers over mountains and hit targets more than three miles away, something conventional artillery couldn't do. So they were extremely useful. But the dilemma that emerged is, and this often happens in areas of shifting technology, as some of you must know, um, who's in charge? The Navy looked at this and said, you know what that is not? That is not a ship. And the Army said, well, no, you, but it floats, right? So this is yours. It'll be manned by sailors. You'll pay them. You'll provide the ammunition and the food. You'll house them. You'll take care of them. No way. That's, you're, I'm not doing that. Now remember that at the time of the Civil War, there is no Department of Defense. The National Security Act that created that dates from 1947. There is a Department of War, which manages the Army, and a Department of the Navy, which manages the Navy. They're both full cabinet officers. They sat on the cabinet and competed with one another for resources. There was no individual who had simultaneous authority over both the Army and the Navy below President of the United States. I tried to explain this once to my midshipman at the Naval Academy, his class full of plebes taking naval history, and I said, you realize, of course, that the highest ranking general in the Army, Winfield Scott himself, could not give an order to the lowest seaman recruit. And they said, well, sir, that's exactly the way it ought to be. That's, that's right. 
but it's also awkward if you're going to manage what today we call joint operations, then called combined operations, where the Army and the Navy cooperate together to secure important points. Somebody's got to be in charge. And so Lincoln said, I'll do it. He got a lieutenant from the White House staff and made him his liaison. And he ran him back and forth to the telegraph office and he told everybody, all right, they're going to be sailors manning the, the boats, but the Army's going to supply the ammunition and, uh, and the food supply. That's going to come from the Army, but the Navy will manage them. Well, sir, what about where are they going to stay? I mean, look at this. There's a tent inside one of these things. You expect them to sleep on that? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to buy a steamer. Here it is. We're going to buy a steamer, and the men will all sleep on the steamer. It will accompany the mortar boats, which will operate as a squadron. He laid all this thing out. President of the United States. And the lieutenant then would telegraph it off to the Western Theater. Oh, okay, fine, we'll do it. And it worked. They turned out to be pretty useful. Here they are. Here's the mortar boats. You can see them anchored along the side of the stream and attacking island number 10 at a bend in the Mississippi right at the Kentucky-Tennessee borderline, which cuts right through there. Um, the capture of island number 10 was sufficiently important strategically that it actually broke the defensive line of the Confederacy in the West. And it might not have happened. If Lincoln hadn't said, look, can't we just figure out a practical way to figure this out? And if nobody else can do it, I'll, I'll do it myself. Here's the third case study. Now we're really going to get almost tactical on this. This is a, a contemporary map of Norfolk, uh, Hampton Roads area. Um, the U.S. Army had landed a major force here, so there's a, a camp in and about Hampton Fortress Monroe, which of course is still there, uh, was the reason why it was pretty much commanded. This is where the, the Bay Bridge Tunnel crosses right here. Here's where all those carriers are now home ported these days. Um, but in effect, this was Union held, and down here, this was all Confederate held. And Lincoln went down to this area personally because he was trying to get his reluctant general, George McClellan, to get moving. He had brought an army of 100,000 men down to the Virginia Peninsula, but he seemed to be happy just to go on a camping trip, and he couldn't get them going. So he arrived personally, seasick all the way, by the way, poor Lincoln. And he got up the next day and the cat on, the, on board the, uh, it's not on the, ah, oh, there it is, the Minnesota, here he is, on board the Minnesota, and the Commodore in charge of the squadron is giving him a, a Tour de Horizon. He says, well, over here, Mr. President, this is, uh, this is Fortress Monroe where we landed, and over here is, uh, this is Newport News Point where the Congress and the Cumberland were both attacked by that dastardly ironclad that the Confederates have, which Northerners call the Merrimack and Southerners call the Virginia. And over here, he said, that's Sewell's Point, that's where the Confederate batteries are. Lincoln said, excuse me, uh, Admiral, can I interrupt you? He says, yes. He says, those Confederate batteries, um, are they within the range of your guns? Well, yes, sir, they are. Been, well, uh, have you tried shooting at them? <laughs> no, we really have not done that because of a variety of reasons. Didn't want to waste our shells and we're not really sure. Well, I think that would be a good thing to do, maybe this afternoon. And so Lincoln went out to what's called the Rip Raps, originally called Fort Calhoun, but after secession renamed Fort Wool, and watched from the ramparts while the Union ships attacked the Confederate batteries on Sewell's Point. And after about three broadsides, the Confederates raised a white flag and fled. Well, that was easy. Great. Lincoln said, uh, Admiral, I have another idea. You can just see him, oh, good. Uh, and yes, Mr. President, what is that? And he says, well, I think we could take some of these 100,000 men that are camped in and around Hampton Roads and the canal boats that we've captured from the Virginia Canal, and we could cross the point and we could land over here and we could march down here and capture Norfolk. Oh, uh, well, Mr. President, you see, we, we don't really have any protocol for that and... Uh, and, 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 and there really is no good landing beach where, where they could go ashore. I see, President, so thank you. 
which is how it came about that Abraham Lincoln and his Secretary of the Treasury, who happened to have come with him on, on the trip, um, this is Salmon P. Chase, whose picture is on the $1,000 bill, I think. I'm sure you have some of those in your wallet. Got in a rowboat with six sailors and did a recon. And they found a beach right over here, kind of where all the pilots have their beachfront condos these days, that was a perfect landing beach. And he went back and he told the Commodore about it. I found a beach where we can land. Oh, good. Well, we'll form a committee. We'll get right to work on this. He says, I think we can do this tomorrow morning because the boats are already there. The men are in their tents. If you call them out, 4 o'clock tomorrow morning, we could have them in the which is how it came about, that a large, almost a division-sized unit landed here at Ocean Beach and marched along these roads down to this little crossing. By the way, before they did that, it was kind of interesting, Lincoln did not go ashore with them. There's some sources that say he did, but I've investigated this pretty closely and he didn't, but Salmon P. Chase did. Salmon P. Chase went ashore, and, and, and it was a mess. It was just chaotic, people milling about smartly, going in no particular direction. And he walked up to the commander and said, General, what's going on here? Why aren't you advancing into the interior? We'll lose our moment of opportunity. He said, well, here, something you don't understand about the Army. You see, we have to advance in the order of the seniority of the colonel of each regiment, and we're not sure of the commissioning dates of some of the colonels. So we're investigating that now. So Chase said, General, let me make this easy for you. I order you in the name of the President of the United States to march to Norfolk now. Okay. So off they go down this road, and they got to this little, there's a little bridge over Tanner's Creek right here. <clears throat> and there was a guy in a carriage who got out of the carriage and walked up to the lead unit and started giving a speech. It's the mayor of Norfolk with the keys to the city. That was a ploy, of course. The Confederates were stalling to get as much out of there as they possibly could before the Yankees arrived. And one of the things they wanted to get out of there was the CSS Virginia, formerly the Merrimack, into which they had poured so much energy, effort, and materiel. Well, they couldn't go upriver because it's too shallow, and they couldn't go out into the Chesapeake because it's too unstable. So they blew it up. So the next time you hear somebody talking about how the Monitor and the Merrimack fought to a draw and nobody won, you can say, yeah, somebody won. And I'll tell you who sunk the Merrimack. Abraham Lincoln. Had he not been there, none of this would have happened. At least it wouldn't have happened at that time. When he was headed back, by the way, uh, there was a newspaper reporter from the Washington Star on board, and he showed, Mr. President, I've written an article about the impact that you had on events in Hampton Roads, and Lincoln said, oh, started to read it and said, oh, no, you can't, you can't publish this. This is, all, this is about me. This is not about me. None of this is about me. It's about the people who did it, the people who crossed in those little canal boats, who landed on that beach, who marched down to Norfolk. It's about them. Don't write about me. And he didn't, which is how most people don't know this story. But here's a couple of things about this man that I think we can pull out of these three case studies. What are the characteristics that made him successful? Number one, patience. You don't always have to act immediately to every single provocation. Sometimes taking a good ready is a good idea. Lincoln was maybe too patient, some said, with George McClellan. Maybe he should have fired him sooner. Maybe not, but maybe. But patience was a characteristic he often employed, and more often than not, it worked in his favor. Number two, in dealing with the problem of the mortar boats in the Western theater, here's a logistical snafu that needed to be straightened out. And instead of saying, well, we're going to rewrite the, the regs and we're going to change, no. He said, let, let me just handle this myself. He's pragmatic. What's the easiest, most immediately available solution that will resolve the problem? Thirdly, down in Hampton Roads, pragmatic, maybe a little less patient, but also 
refusal to make it about him, his lack of ego investment in the decisions that he made and the policies he promoted. Patience, pragmatism, and absence of ego investment. And there's one more I'm going to add. I'll end with this one. My friend Gene Baker, who taught at Goucher College for many years, says, you always have to say, I'll end with this one, somewhere in the speech, so people have hope. But I'll end with this one. And that is, I think, one of the things that kept Lincoln stable and sane was his sense of humor. He had a famous sense of humor. And he deployed it with great deliberateness. People would come into his office. In those days, you could literally walk into the president's office and say, I got a bone to pick with you, Mr. President. And Lincoln would sit down and listen to him. And he'd hear him out, and then he'd say, that reminds me of a story. And he'd start to tell it. And it would be a kind of a shaggy dog story, and it would go on a little while. And then Lincoln would laugh at his own jokes. He'd throw his head back, and he'd laugh, and he'd slap his knee, and he'd get up. And the guy would, of course, get up too. And Lincoln would walk him to the door, thank him for coming to see me, and off he'd go. And the guy would get halfway down the hall and say, wait a minute. What just happened here? <laughs> but Lincoln used that sense of humor a lot. He used it tactically, strategically, diplomatically, any number of ways. I'll, I'll tell one Lincoln story. I asked John Jackson if I could tell this story. He told me it would be all right. Lincoln, as you probably know, used to ride the circuit in Illinois before he was a politician when Stephen Douglas, later his rival for both the Senate and the presidency, was the judge of the circuit. And Lincoln and a team of other lawyers would all travel together, and they'd show up in a town, and all the accumulated cases would come before the court. And they'd sometimes flip a coin, decide who was offense and defense, and prosecute or defend, as the case might be. And Lincoln was charged in this particular case with defending someone who committed a crime, and I have to confess, I don't even remember what it was. But the prosecuting attorney got up in front of the jury at the end, after all the witnesses had spoken, he said, gentlemen of the jury, and they were only gentlemen in those days, gentlemen of the jury, this is a cut and dried case. There is no doubt whatsoever as a decision you must turn in. This man is guilty. Look at the facts. You have this fact, motive, opportunity, circumstance, witnesses, fact, 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 fact. He sat down. Now it's Lincoln's turn. He unfolds himself from his chair and he walks over in front of the jury and he says, you know, facts are interesting things. And that reminds me of a story. <laughs> Seems there was this farmer out in, and then wherever he is, you know, in, in, in Indianapolis or whatever, and he had to get his hay crop in. Well, you know how difficult that is. You gotta beat the rain. So he's getting in his hay crop and he hired uh, a sort of extra man, a handyman, an itinerant worker, and, and he's helping him get the hay in, and he'd gone into the house to, to get something, and his, his little son comes running, he says, Pa, Pa, we got trouble, we're in terrible trouble. And he says, Son, what's the matter, what is it? And he says, Well, it's Sis and the handyman. They're out in the barn. And Sis, she's got her dress pulled up like this, and the handyman, he's got his pants pulled down like that. Pa, they're fixing to pee on our hay. <laughs> to which Lincoln says, which shows you can have all the facts right. Still come to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> and he won the case. Thank you very much. It's time for questions. John says we have time for some questions. I don't know any more Lincoln jokes. No, it's not, it's not true. Oh dear, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, come on, it's like this in Spruance Auditorium at Strategy and Policy Lectures. And what the, what the professors do is just wait them out. You can't leave till somebody asks a question. <laughs> Who's going to take one for the team? Right here. <laughs> hey, Dave. Right. 
Um, so you talked about Lincoln actually getting in the boat, going out to the battlefield down in Hampton Roads. Um, whether he had been there previously before you talked about he went out and did recon, was he the kind of gentleman that would do that and, and research what he was, um, before he was about to ask somebody to do something, was he aware of Hampton Roads and what it was, or was that just a fly on the wind, we gotta go down there, we're gonna figure it out? I think more the latter. I think his view was that, look, if it's true that you really are avoiding confronting the enemy because you do not see where a land, a troops could possibly land, I'm just gonna take a look and see if I can discover a place where they land. It was not that he made a practice of second-guessing commanders in the field. That was not the way he did business. He liked to hire a general, whoever it might be, whether it's McClellan, who proved disappointing, or Grant, who proved very satisfactory, and say, you're the expert. Tell me what you need. I will provide you with what you need and support you. I'll hold your coat. I'll hold your, hold your horse. I'll do whatever is necessary. But in this particular case, he saw that things had hit a roadblock because there was a lack of information, and nobody had picked up the obligation to follow through, and so he did it himself. I think it was part of that pragmatism as much as anything else. Is there a, a way to solve this that just is commonsensical? We got another one? Ah, uh oh You mentioned briefly that um, there was a lot of new technology at this point in time. How did President Lincoln prepare himself, or did he surround himself with people who were aware of yeah. these emerging technologies? And how did he position himself to take advantage of them? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. If I could have bribed you to ask that question, I would have done it. Uh, Lincoln was a gadget guy by instinct. One of the characteristics that he had, if we add more characteristics, he really was into gadgets. He remains, to this day, the only president in the history of the United States to have a patent. Which, he, which, as it turns out, had to do with naval things. He invented a device that could be used for lifting river steamers over sandbars. It got a patent approval and actually turned out not to be a financial success, but he still holds it, and the model is in the Smithsonian Institution to this day. So he was really interested in new technology, and he used to go down to the Washington Navy Yard routinely, sometimes just to get out of the White House, but also because he liked to see new things tried out, people who invented repeating rifles, early machine guns, uh, extra large uh, uh, caliber naval guns. John Adolphus Dahlgren was a close friend of his. They both had children who died young, and that bonded them, but also they were really bonded over that uh, technology and that ordinance. Famously, when uh, the uh, Monitor, the, the North's ironclad that fought in Hampton Roads, let me go back and see that, here we go, here we go, here we go. Uh, would not have been built at all but for him. Uh, it was presented to him as this novel little device, and of course you can imagine this six foot four inch man leaning over the table and playing with this little model toy. And he asked its, uh, its promoter, Cornelius Bushnell, he said, what are you, what's happening now? And he said, well, I have to go present this to a board of Navy captains who had previously said ironclads. And Lincoln said, you know what, I think I'll go with you. So he went, and there in this room, gathered around the table, and Bushnell makes his presentation, this can do this, it's got a rotating turret, can fire in any direction hardly exposed at all because of very low freeboard. And the captains are looking at this and saying, this does not look like a ship to me. But everybody's waiting to see what the president's going to say. So finally, the chairman of the board turned to the president, Mr. President, what do you think, Lincoln? Well, it reminds me of what the girl said when she put her foot in the stocking. I think there's something in it. So they bought it. They gave him 100 days to build it, completed it on the uh, 4th of March, and two days later it was in Hampton Roads fighting the Merrimack. But for Lincoln it would not have happened. So he was very much a gadget guy. He was on the front edge of whatever technology he thought, pragmatically, could promote a successful outcome to the war. Thank you for that. Anybody? I was just going to ask the, um, Charles Wilkes, is there any uh, relationship between him and John Wilkes 
Booth? Ah, uh, no, no, the Wilkes. Uh, John Wilkes was a British uh, anti-monarchical politician, and a lot of people named children uh, for John Wilkes, including Mr. and Mrs. Booth, apparently. Uh, but this Wilkes was completely independent of him. Interesting question, because I had to look too, and the answer is no. Yes? If I recall correctly, and if I don't recall correctly, please let me down gently, but if I recall correct correctly, uh, Lincoln actually studied warfare strategy and tactics some while he was president in order to suit himself more uh, sufficiently to be commander in chief. Um, what do you, how, how much did that help him in his duties as commander in chief? Great question. Um, you know, when the Naval Academy was founded in the middle of the 19th century, there are a lot of people who opposed to the Naval Academy by saying you can't teach ducks to swim in an attic. The way to become a naval officer is to get out to sea and do it. Well, no. In an age of advancing technology, there are things you have to learn. And Lincoln was an autodidact anyway, famously taught himself, literally taught himself to read, had very few books to hand, uh, but whenever he could get a book, he studied it. And when he became president, we know this because he's actually wrote his name on the checkout list at the Library of Congress for books by Jomini and other theoreticians, uh, not Clausewitz, by the way. Clausewitz had not been translated into English yet. But every book on military engineering, military technology, military leadership that he could get his hands on. And what it equipped him to do was talk to his generals and to his admirals in their language. I mean, sometimes there's a tendency for an expert to start using jar, expertise jargon to intimidate your audience. Well, you don't really know because you don't know what a, whatever the latest acronym is. Lincoln learned all that. They didn't have so many acronyms in those days. But he did learn the language and, and the, uh, the general understanding, the, the general uh, uh, lexicon of military decision making. Uh, and I think that, combined with his natural pragmatism, patience, lack of ego investment, and sense of humor, enabled him to make sound decisions in the long run. Um, there's a wonderful book. I mean, my book is called Lincoln and His Admirals. There's a wonderful book called Lincoln and His Generals by T. Harry Williams, published in 1952, where Williams shows time and again how Lincoln grew as a commander during the war. In 1861, he was unsure of himself, let other people make decisions that probably he wouldn't have made or approved. But by 1864, he was the master of not only the practical events, but also the theoretical events. And it's because he read, because he taught himself military strategy from books out of the Library of Congress. It's too bad he never had a chance to go to the Naval War College. How are we doing? You know, Naval War College, if I could, uh, Craig. So the U.S. Navy during the Civil War is pretty impressive, pretty innovative and whatnot. What happened between the end of the Civil War and the 1880s when Stephen B. Luce helped founded this institution and why was it necessary to that be done? Well, as a rule, uh, if you measure navies in terms of the size of the fleet they can put to sea, the Navy's history is like a sine wave. Uh, we, as a people, kind of let things go fallow in peacetime. And then we get panicky, and all of a sudden they fire back up again. So if you actually measure that in terms, you can see where they go up dramatically during the Civil War, then drop off dramatically in the 1870s and 1880s, shoot up again in the 1890s, and then level a little bit, then way up in World War I, and so on. And many historians have looked at that period between 1865 in 1898, between the end of the American Civil War and the Spanish-American War, as, a kind of a, as one of those troughs. But I think Lincoln would have looked at that. This is only opinion. This does not represent the views of the Department of Defense and all that. I think Lincoln would have looked at that as a pragmatic way to respond. The technology was coming so fast. Ships were moving not only from sail to steam, but from paddle wheels to screw propellers. The triple expansion engine came into play for the first time so that the efficiency of marine engines improved dramatically. And those changes were taking so fast, were taking place so fast along with technology. The guns got bigger, the army got, armor got thicker until the armor was so thick the ships could barely move. 
In which case, well, maybe not, that's not the way to go. Britain tried to keep up with all of these and went through generation after generation of very expensive worship types while the United States watched. So that by the time it did adopt a new navy in the 1890s and brought about those first steam and steel ships that sub subsequently became the Great White Fleet, we took advantage of all that accumulated technology and did it all at once. So it looks like, oh, what a terrible policy-making decision this is to allow the Navy to go from, uh, I think at the end of the American Civil War, we had 671 commissioned warships, roughly almost three times as many as we have today, more than double what we have today, and had 70 five years later. Oh, tragedy. Not necessarily because American national interests were never imperiled. We took advantage of everybody else's experiments, including their dead ends, and then built the fleet we needed for the 20th century. So I would argue that even though it looks like a period of disappointment, it was actually a period of very clever patience. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I, I, I just wondered what kind of education they had had and training you know, as a progression from cadet to whatever, and the uh, related question would be, was there no interplay between the Army and the Navy, or, or even just straight thinking, we've got a goal to take this thing, and then who's analyzing anything that the President has to come down and do it for them? That, that to me, is unbelievable that somebody beside the president didn't already <laughs> do exactly what he did. Okay, those are two questions. Let me do the first one first. I knew it was two. <laughs> That's okay. Let me do the first one first, and that is that the very senior officers uh, in the United States Navy were not Naval Academy graduates. Naval Academy was founded in 1845. It didn't have a four-year program until 1850, so the people who graduated from the Naval Academy, the earliest in 1854, were still relatively junior when the Civil War broke out. So some of the uh, lieutenants, and ensigns, and so forth, they were Naval Academy products, but the commanders of the fleets were, had learned the old way, uh, on the job. They'd become midshipmen when they were 13 years old, took the midshipman's exam at 16, 17, became past midshipman, and then got promoted to lieutenant when an opening took place. Uh, and promotions were very, very slow, as John Rogers exemplifies. Um, it's a system that worked well at the time. It's not a system that works well with the new technology, because you can't just learn calculus by watching the wind blow across the surface. Unfortunately, I found that out, but in any case. The second answer to your question is, it does seem remarkable that the Army and the Navy were almost like allies on the same side, but not part of the same country. And that is absolutely the case, as remarkable as it seems. And the best example of that, I suppose, is the Vicksburg campaign. Grant took Vicksburg in 1863 at virtually the same time the Battle of Gettysburg was being fought. The two twin events that broke the Confederacy. And the taking of Vicksburg was impossible without a joint operation. It's up on a bluff 200 feet high. The ships can't go up there. The sailors can't get to it unless they can go on the ships. And so Grant went to his naval counterpart, David Dixon Porter, and said, Admiral, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to run your ships past that fort and transport my men across the river so I can get to the back door. Now, Porter doesn't have to do that. Porter can say, oh, you'd like that, would you? Well, uh, what? no, he, he can't take orders from a general, any general. But he did it, because Grant went out of his way to do the kind of thing I believe Lincoln would have done. Sat him down and said, Admiral, I really admire your brilliant insight. Let's together figure out how we can do this. Do you think this would work? You do? What, what a great idea. Why don't we try that? So it had to be a case where the general and the admiral agreed to cooperate voluntarily because there was no joint commander in the Civil War except Abraham Lincoln. Yes? Sir, you've mentioned several times about um, Lincoln's sense of humor and how it got him through a, his presidency. What lessons in resilience can our military and our Navy take from that now? 
I think it's important not to take, to take your job as seriously as you can, but not to take yourself so seriously. And it's an easy thing to say, it's a difficult thing to do. We're all human, we all think we're the single most important person on the planet. And to get yourself out of that is, is a remarkable feat. Uh, but I think it's necessary, and I think a sense of humor contributes to that. Almost all of the jokes Lincoln told were, were self-effacing, uh, self-deprecating, uh, made himself the butt of many of those jokes. One of my favorites is he was accused by uh, Stephen Douglas during one of their debates of being two-faced. And Lincoln said, two-faced? You think if I had another face, I'd wear this one? <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing that he could do. And it, it, it eased him up, it eased up the audience, it eased up Stephen Douglas, for that matter. So I think having a sense of humor and being able not to take yourself too seriously is a critical element of effective leadership. Yes. There's one over there. Is there going to be a quiz tonight, uh, Craig? No quiz. Oh. No quiz. Thanks, David. Thank you, Professor oh, Simmons. Oh, hi, Trip. I didn't see you. Yeah. Uh, 671 ships, Lincoln and his admirals. With that size Navy, how many admirals were there in the, US Na oh. the Union Navy at that time? Thank you. Uh, a lot fewer than we have today. I, I don't know the exact number. Uh, it's, it's in two digits. Um, and and I'll, I'll look. This is what we learned to say at the academy. I'll find out, sir. Um, I'll look it up. But I, I, I'm going to guess and say something like 30 total. I mean, at, at, the, at, the, at its peak. Uh, remember, there were no admirals at all in 1861. The belief in the United States was that Navies are instruments of empire. So while it's perfectly fine to have generals in command of an army, because an army represents the people, we've been used to thinking of Britain as the enemy, and Britain's navy was the one who always imposed those dreaded taxes we didn't want to pay. So navies were instrument of empire, so that admirals were somehow suspicious. There were no admirals in the history of the United States until 1862, when David Glasgow Farragut became the first. Um, and even by the end of it, at its peak, I think there were something like 26, 28, and that's a guess. Uh, but I, I take your point. We have a, a lot of chiefs and fewer Indians. Um, then we had lots of Indians and fewer chiefs. Um, whatever that may be worth. Yeah. I don't know if it's relevant to this time period, but the term Commodore, when was it first used in the Navy? Yeah, it was. Commodore in the age of sail was a term that simply referred to whoever was the senior captain among a group of ships, four ships escorting a convoy, going on a mission, whatever it might be. Whoever was the senior captain in that group had an honorific of Commodore, and he could fly the long pennant. Uh, later on then, during the Civil War, Commodore became a term that was used regularly, interchangeably with flag officer. That implies that he has a flag, a pennant, but he's still not an admiral, because Congress just could not bring itself to create the rank until 1862, and that, of course, was a, a thank you to Farragut for seizing New Orleans in April of 1862. But uh, Commodore, now Rear Admiral Lower Half, the one-star rank, we've gone back and forth figuring out what to call that. The Army, Army always thought this was a, a bad deal. If you're a, an 06 in the Army and you get promoted, you become a one-star. If you're an 06 in the Navy and got promoted, you were a two-star. Hey! The Army would say, Let, that's not right. Anyway, it's where we are. Who else? Any last question? Yes, sir. Last question on the aisle on this side. So going along with that question about the, the Commodore, it made me think was, um, especially given the, the river maneuvers that were going on, how much of Lincoln and, and his riverine warfare, I guess, for lack of a better term, translated into the riverboat economy immediately post-Civil War, um, did, it, did, did any of that experience help foster uh, that industry afterward? Um, it's, it's hard to make a direct connection between those two, but you know Lincoln was a river guy. 
You know, he first learned to hate slavery when he was a teenager and actually drifted down the Mississippi River to New Orleans and saw his first slave auction, which he wrote later seared him for the rest of his life and made him uh, the politician that he became and the president that he became as well. So he was very interested in the rivers. He understood the commercial importance of the rivers. He understood that, that taking Vicksburg, uh, famous phrase, Vicksburg is the key to the Confederacy, and we cannot win this war until that key is in our pocket. Because the Mississippi River drained the entire Midwest, all the products. River uh, Railroads were becoming important now, but most of the trade still went down the Mississippi, and our greatest port of export was New Orleans, not New York, uh, because of the river system. So he was sensitive to all of that and knew about it. Uh, but I think what he was trying to do was restore the commercial value of that river system that had existed before the war, rather than to create a new kind of river system, because his interest in technology led him to support railroads as well. And remember, the Transcontinental Railroad Bill was signed in his administration as well. So, okay, thank you very much, everybody. By the power vested in me as the master of ceremonies, I declare you best in show. Okay, so. All right, our next uh, lecture is going to be on Tuesday, the 17th of March, and Dr. Jim Holmes will be uh, speaking about U.S. naval power in the Pacific. Jim is uh, very bright, and you'll enjoy that.